If you have your Bible with you this morning, would you turn with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. And we're going to read from the opening chapter. Leviticus chapter 1. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring an offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. It is, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a meal without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it in pieces, and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons the priest shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat and the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs shall he wash with water. And the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. With them the reading there, we know that the Lord will add his own blessing to the public reading of his own precious and inspired word. You join with me in a word of prayer as we come to God's word this morning. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow again before your throne of grace, we come, Lord, with confidence in Jesus' name. We do not draw near with any sense of acceptance before you that is based upon our merit but an acceptance that is based only and entirely upon the merit of the blood and righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that through him we have access to that throne of grace, and we come therefore, Lord, rejoicing in our acceptance by grace through faith in Christ, knowing, Lord, that even now you incline your ear to the cry of our hearts. And our cry, Lord, would be that you will come as you have promised in power among us, Minister to the needs of our souls in your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for the food that it gives to our hearts. Thank you for the fact that in it we see Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that he is the joy and the delight of our hearts. And so that's the desire, Lord, today that we bring to you, sir. We would see Jesus was the request made to the disciples. And we make that ours today. Open our eyes to see him. Deliver us from spiritual blindness. Grant, Lord, the power and unction of the Holy Ghost, and grant, Lord, the protection of the blood of the Lamb against every attack of the enemy. We ask this in Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake, and God's people say, Amen. Well, last time that I was with you, it seems a very long time ago now, uh, we were engaged in a series of studies on gospel pictures in the Old Testament. We have seen already that our Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of the entirety of the Old Testament as pointing to and revealing him. A number of verses of scripture, we just bring ourselves up to speed on this, that which, uh, which will establish that which we have just stated, the words of Jesus to the enemies that he faced, the Pharisees, the religious establishment, when he said in John 5 and 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Later on in that same chapter, verse 46, he said, Moses wrote about me. And then on the road to Emmaus in Luke's Gospel 24, it says that the Savior speaking to the two disconsolate and doubting disciples, the beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
And later on in the upper room, the same chapter, verse 44, he said to the disciples, all that was written in the law of Moses and the prophets of the Psalms concerning me must be fulfilled. These are enough, I think, to prove to us conclusively that as far as the incarnate God himself was concerned, the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures were given that they might point to and reveal him and the work that he came to do. That, of course, raises the question, how is Jesus Christ revealed in the Old Testament? We have considered some of these already. We saw that he came in person as the angel of the covenant, he is revealed also in the promises that begin way back in Genesis 3.15 where he is identified as the seed of the woman who would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. And then he is also revealed in what we will call the pictures of the Old Testament. And these fall into, I think, two major categories at least, some of which we have already considered. First of all, the characters in the Old Testament. The Bible focuses a lot in the Old Testament upon three offices which Jesus Christ fulfilled in himself. The office of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king. And so all of these offices, filled as they were by fallen and faulty men, were nevertheless pictures and revelations of one who would fulfill them perfectly as the God-man who was without sin. But also we find not only the offices of these characters pointing to Christ, but some of their actions as well. And we've looked, for example, at the, uh, the story of David and Mephibosheth, the son or grandson of an old enemy, distant, away, having lost all of the inheritance that would have belonged to him as a prince of Israel, Nevertheless, by the grace of David, brought to the king's table with all of that which he had lost, restored. And what a beautiful picture of what God does for us in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God that through the Savior's work and ministry, we have restored to us that which was lost by the fall of Adam. And as Isaac Watts said, in his great hymn, in him, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their fathers lost. And then, of course, we thought about Joseph and his brethren and how he revealed himself to them and was reconciled to them. And what a beautiful picture of what our heavenly Joseph, the Lord Jesus, does for us in reconciling us to himself solely by his grace. And then we thought about the picture in Zechariah chapter 3, where Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord, clothed, as the scripture says, in filthy garments, and how that he was cleansed and clothed and crowned. And what a picture it is again of what happens to us in the gospel. But moving on from characters and their offices and actions, one of the major ways in which Jesus Christ and his work is revealed is through what we call the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. Now if you've studied the scriptures at all you will realize and I think some of our confessions of faith have talked about this that the law of God is generally regarded as falling under three headings. There's what we call the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments which is obligatory for all time upon all people. And then there is what is called the judicial law, which was given to Israel. It contains, for example, the layout of the land and the inheritance of the various tribes and the establishment of Jerusalem as the capital and so on. And then there is what we call the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law deals particularly with Israel's worship. It deals with things like the tabernacle, its construction, its articles of furniture, and more importantly and specifically with all of the feasts and sacrifices which God ordained that his people observe. And you'll find this laid out mostly in the book of Leviticus, not exclusively. You'll find parts in the book of Exodus and in Parts in the book of Deuteronomy as well, but mostly 
in the book of Leviticus, from which we have read this morning. And it gives to us a series of descriptions of the various sacrifices that the people of Israel could offer unto the Lord. The one that we're going to look at this morning, the first one, is the burnt offering. But you'll also, for example, see in the next chapter the grain or the meat offering, the peace offering, and the sin offering, and so on. And, and all of these sacrifices were established by God for the observance of his people. And I say, well, that's all very interesting and all very good, but you're probably saying under your breath, well, Pastor, the book of Leviticus isn't exactly my favorite book in the Bible. And uh, it, it's very complex. And, and it certainly, it certainly at, at one level, is very detailed and very particular. But how are we, how are we to understand this book? And I would put it to you very, uh, very strongly this morning that the way to understand the Leviticus is by reading the book of Hebrews. That's why I read from Hebrews this morning. Because when you come to the book of Hebrews, what you'll find the inspired writer doing is comparing and contrasting the Old Testament ceremonial law with what has now come to pass and been fulfilled in the person and through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I read from chapters 9 and 10, you can read these for yourselves, and you'll discover that the writer signals out at least two major themes, the priesthood and the sacrifices. And he compares and he contrasts the priesthood of the Old Testament, specifically the priesthood of Aaron, who was the high priest, with the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. And then he compares and he contrasts the sacrifices of the Old Testament with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the words that recur again and again in the book of Hebrews are words like greater and better. And he makes it very clear to us that this Old Testament priesthood was but a shadow and but a type and but a prefiguring of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament sacrifices were also foreshadowings of that greater reality to come, which was the sacrifice once and for all of our Savior upon the cross at Calvary. How appropriate, therefore, this study is this morning for the beginning of Holy Week as we begin to reflect again upon the Savior's last steps that led him to the cross and eventually out of the tomb. And so we want to look this morning with that all said and all kept in mind at this burnt offering as a picture of the gospel. We've talked about the series uh, under the heading of gospel pictures in the Old Testament scripture. And this is one here in the book of Leviticus chapter 1. I hope that as we look at it, you'll be encouraged to look again at Leviticus with the book of Hebrews in hand. And remember that what you're seeing in every one of these sacrifices is the work of Christ foreshadowed, typified, illustrated, pictured, and prefigured for us. And as we look at the burnt offering this morning, I want to just leave you with three major thoughts that come out of the verses that we read. Three words that will sum up those three thoughts. The first word is access, or if you like, approach. And by that I mean approach or access to God into his presence. That's the first thought. And you'll find that this, this whole theme of access to God is a theme that recurs again and again in the various specific sacrifices that are detailed for Israel here. We could, we could have taken, for example, the, 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 the Day of Atonement, which is talked about later on in the book. Uh, but you'll find again that this thought of access to God is one of the predominant themes that is taught to Israel and to us in, in, that, in that particular uh, ordinance. The second major word and thought is the word atonement. This word atonement occurs many, many times in Scripture, and a great number of those times occur here in this book of Leviticus, the theme of atonement. 
And then finally, the other word, the third word, is the word acceptance. Acceptance. And you'll see how that this word occurs at the end of verse 3 and at the beginning of verse 4. When we talk about the person bringing the offering to the Lord, what for? It says that he might be accepted before the Lord. And it says he shall lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So these are three words. I would put it to you, these are three gospel words. And I want to think this morning of this as a great picture of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, therefore, access or approach to God. Now, why should this question of access occur so often in the book of Leviticus? Why should it occur to us? The question of access to God. Well, we have to begin by recognizing something that is very sobering and something that is very solemn. And that is that we have to recognize that man by nature is separated from God. Man by nature is separated from God. Now it's true that in terms of proximity, God is not far from any one of us. But when we're talking about separation, we're talking about man being out of fellowship with God. You know, two people can be close together in terms of geographical location, and yet they can be distant from one another in terms of fellowship. And that's exactly what man's condition is by nature. Well, we know it was not always so, and it was not the intent of God when he first created our parents, and it should be so. Adam and Eve enjoyed fellowship with God. The Lord God came down to the garden and he communed with his creatures. And I think that those words that are occurring in the old gospel hymn, he walks with me and talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And when I think of those words, I think that must have been Adam and Eve's experience in the garden. God walked with them. God talked with them. There's sweet communion together. There was an unbroken fellowship. There was a perfect harmonious relationship. The Bible uses the word shalom. And it's often translated peace, and it does, of course, mean peace, but it means more than that. It means harmony. It means wholeness. It means things that are, are working together as they're supposed to work together. And, and that was what happened in the garden. Adam knew the Lord, and Eve knew the Lord, and they knew fellowship with the Lord. It was unmarred, unbroken. But then what happened? What was the reason? What was the reason then for this breach? Well, you know the story as well as I do. Genesis chapter 3, man sinned. A man broke the covenant of God. Man disobeyed the commandment of the Lord. And the consequence of man's sin was that there was an interruption in the communion that he had once enjoyed with his Creator and with his Lord. And instead of Adam now, when God comes into the garden, rushing out to meet his Creator, with a glad anticipation of fellowship and joy in his presence, we find Adam and his wife fleeing from the presence of the Lord, seeking to hide from the company of the Lord, and eventually being driven out from the garden itself. And hence you have in Scripture for the first time this theme that's been recurring throughout the Bible, the theme of exile, being driven out from the presence of God. You see, there has been a rift there has been a rupture in the relationship. And Adam, of course, stood as the representative head of the whole of the human race. And you and I, according to Scripture, were in Adam. And that's the great teaching of St. Paul when he said, As in Adam all die. For one by one man, that is Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And therefore death is passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And friends, this morning among the effects and the results and the consequences of sin is this reality, this fearful, sobering reality that there has been a rupture in the relationship between God. We are distant from Him in terms of the relationship. And that's what Isaiah was stating so clearly in chapter 59 and verse 2 of his prophecy when he said, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. 
because all of this is true. The question of access then comes up. How can I as a sinner, how can I as one who has offended God, and therefore has justly come under the curse and condemnation of God. How can I dare to approach this God that I have offended? What way can I enter again into his presence and be welcomed into his presence? Is the question of access. I would put it to you that this thought of man's distance from God and being fell out of fellowship with God is revealed even in the layout of the tabernacle. We're talking now about feasts and sacrifices that have occurred mostly at the tabernacle, later on at the temple. And if you could just in your mind just picture for a moment what the tabernacle looked like. a sort of a rectangular shape made of curtains of various descriptions. Uh, it was called the tent. And inside it there was a tent within a tent. But when you came to the opening or to the apron, sometimes called the door, was the door in the sense that you and I would understand that it was just a curtain, basically. But you would come in through into the entrance, and you would first of all you would meet the brazen altar of sacrifice, where this particular sacrifice would have taken place. And then, if you advanced a little further forward, you'd have found a huge bronze basin called a liver, which was filled with water. And then if you go a little further, you would find what I call the tent within the tent, which was divided into two places, the holy place, and that was a place into which only the priests could enter. And there were three major articles of furniture there. There was the table of showbread, or the bread of the presence. There was the candlestick, and there was the golden altar of incense. And then there was this huge curtain. And beyond that curtain, there was one article of furniture. It was the Ark of the Covenant. And it was only on the Day of Atonement that the high priest could go beyond that veil. And in, he could only go beyond that veil in the way that God had prescribed and appointed for him. That's, that's the tabernacle. So if you can envisage it in your mind, let's say the... The holiest of all is here, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and God said, that's where I will dwell. I will meet with you, I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, which was the lid of the Ark, from between the two cherubim on either side. That was called the Shekinah glory, the, the presence of God, coming from the Hebrew word Shekan, meaning to dwell. God dwelt there as a fiery presence. But the people were way out here. And so there was this whole business of access. Who can draw near? How can we draw near to God? And so I say even in the, in, the, in the layout and in the construction of the tabernacle, there is something there revealed of the reality of man's distance from God. And that is reinforced by that which to which, to which I've already referred, the presence of the veil. Friday, I understand, in the United Service, we're going to be speaking about the rent veil, which happened at the cross. But I get ahead of myself, don't I? The veil spoke, and spoke powerfully and eloquently, about the fact that man was separated from God. He dared not enter into the holiest of all. There was a threat of death to anyone who had entered unbidden or unprepared and as I said only the high priest and only on one day and only in the way prescribed by God could he enter in beyond that veil. The presence of God was barred to sinful man. And so the question therefore is why should this bother us? If you and I have no access to God because of our sin, if we cannot approach God because of our sin, should that bother us at all? Absolutely it should, because access to God, beloved, is the greatest blessing that we could have. Standing in the presence of God is the greatest joy that, could ever, that we could ever experience. You remember how the psalmist put it in Psalm 16? He said, in my presence there is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there is pleasure forevermore. The presence of God is the place where we know the joy of the Lord, where we experience 
the pleasure of the Lord, where we know the protection of the Lord. And if access to God is the greatest blessing that we could know, then denial of that access is the greatest loss that we could experience. The question, therefore, must come to us, is there a way that the exiled can return? Is there a way that those who are estranged can be reconciled? Is there a way that there, the enmity that separates us from God can be removed? Is there a way of approach to God again? Which brings us to the second thought. And the second thought is atonement. Notice what it says to us at the end of verse 4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. To make atonement for him. Now, I don't want to go into all the technical meanings of the various words that are used in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament with regard to atonement. But just think that even in our ordinary, everyday English parlance, we have a kind of an understanding, at least in some measure, sometimes it's a little mixed up, and, but, but nevertheless, we have some idea of what it means uh, to make atonement. We have the idea, we, we convey the idea, and you'll find this if you look, for example, in the English Dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary, or the Cambridge Dictionary. The thought of the idea of atonement is the idea of making amends. Or making reparation for wrongs that have been done. Wrongs that have been committed. In order that reconciliation can be effected. And so we seek to atone. We seek to, to make amends. We seek to, to make reparation for the wrong that has been committed. In the New Testament the word propitiation is used. The Bible talks about God setting Christ forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. In fact, it goes on to say, and John the Apostle writes of this, that Jesus Christ himself is our propitiation. That's a big word, but what does it mean? The idea behind the word propitiation is the idea of satisfaction to God. Satisfaction specifically to the law and to the demands of the law. In order that the breach might be repaired, the rupture might be dissolved, and that access and fellowship with God again can be known and experienced and enjoyed. Friends, this morning it's important above everything else to recognize this, that if reconciliation with God is to be effected, then atonement is necessary. It's indispensable. It is absolutely essential. Unless, unless the wrath of God is appeased, unless the demands of justice because of our sin, and remember, we are the offenders, God is the offended party, unless in some way propitiation can be made, then reconciliation cannot be effected. And here, my friend, the question comes up, then what atonement is to be made? What atonement will be acceptable to God? What atonement will fulfill every claim and demand of divine law and justice? And the next question then coming from that will be, can we make such an atonement? Can we pay the debt as it were ourselves? Can we make amends on our own? Have we the capacity, the ability to, to, to make reparation to God for our sin. There was a question asked away over in the, the book of Micah, of all places. One of the minor prophets, and he says this in Micah chapter 6. He says, with what shall I come before the Lord? And by myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Can you 
see what essentially the prophet is asking here is this. How can I make access to God? How can I so please God and satisfy his law? And make atonement for my sin. That I will be reconciled to him. And of course I think latent in the heart and mind of every person that believes in God at all. And believes in the reality of their own sinfulness at all. There is always the question of how. How, how can God, how can I have access to God? How can God accept me? And of course, the religions of the world will give their answer to that. And the answer is always you. And what you do. And the works that you perform. I care not what alternative to Christianity you may look upon. It will teach that to some degree or another you can by your own efforts. Make atonement for your sin and gain access to God. I think of those words in Proverbs that says there is a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. <laughs> now I know that statement is much broader than just the thought of access to God. The man uh, looks at his own ways, his, his lifestyle, his actions, his behavior, his habits, we get right over them all, there's a way that seems right to a man. But when it comes to the question of access to God, the, the, the truth and the principle still applies. There's a way that seems right unto a man. I've spoken to enough people who have been on the edge of death and facing death, and have asked them about their confidence of acceptance with God. And I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard the refrain again and again as they look to themselves and their actions and what they have done and what they thought they had accomplished. And yet the Bible, the Bible is so blunt and so clear on this. Isaiah 64 and verse 6, All your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Can't be worse than that. Filthy rags. No, I want to be graphic. Make the point. Rags covered in excrement and vomit. Odious and obnoxious and disgusting that are only fit to be thrown into the fire and burned. And God says, this is, this is man at his best. This is man's righteousness. This is all his attempts to, to please God and to do right before God. And if anything is clear from that verse, it is this. The man can never merit by his best achievements the favor of an offended God. And yet there are so many people, and you've met them, and you've talked to them, if you're a Christian at all. And this is, this is their confidence. This is the basis of their hope. This is the ground of their expectancy of acceptance to God and access into his presence and the enjoyment of his favor. And yet, again and again, we find in Scripture that God makes it clear that this is not the way. This can never be the way. And it is nothing more if you look to that. But the leafy arrangements of the enemy of our souls are with a pitfall of perdition. But notice, notice here that God gives the prescription. The, the, the first verse is not simply an introduction. It's telling us something. It says, The Lord God called unto Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them. And he gives the prescription. Friends, a very basic and simple fact arising from that is this, that if atonement is to be made, and therefore access to God is to be gained, then God must tell us how it's to be done. God must prescribe the way in, 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 which it, in which it takes place. And only in God's way can we, make, can we know that atonement and can we experience that access to God. And God only has one way, as we well know, and we'll see in a moment. The way is given by God, the offended party. 
And it is his way and only his way that atonement can be made and access to his presence can be gained. And notice not only the prescription, but notice the particulars. I'll just give you three or four, maybe, simple headings that you will remember. It was the way of sacrifice. It was the way of a spotless sacrifice. Notice that the sacrifice that was to be given to God was to be without blemish. You will find this repeated again and again in the scripture, that the sacrifices brought to God must be without blemish. Sacrifices that were spotless. But above everything else, when you look at God ordaining the sacrifice and the spotless sacrifice, the emphasis and the importance and this brings us right to the very heart of the gospel itself. It was to be a substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, what happened to the sacrifice was that it was to be killed. It was to die. But it was to die, as it were, in the place of the one who brought the offering unto the Lord. Substitution lies at the very heart of the gospel friends because you and I very well know and let me repeat it again with clarity and with joy this morning that the way of atonement which you and I cannot make and with all the ingenuity that the human mind can possibly bring to try and philosophize a way to get accepted with God all of it is nothing all of it is nothing but glorified sin but God has made a way and there is only one way. And that way is through the sacrifice of a spotless victim who would be the substitute for sinners, who would make atonement for their sin and pay their debt. And on the basis of his atoning sacrifice, provided a way whereby they could have fellowship with God again. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. All this, all this is, is a picture. All this is a type. You know that, you know of course that Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. You know that he is the spotless lamb without blemish and without spot. You know that he took the sinner's place and suffered in his stead. For man, O oh miracle of grace, for man, the Savior bled. He's hanging on that cross, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He's suffering for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God. He has made sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Friends, the heart of the gospel is plenary, substitutionary atonement. Plenary meaning full, substitutionary, you know the well, well the meaning of it, in the place of, on behalf of, in the stead of, the sinner Christ makes atonement. Here, friends, is grace. Here is the gospel of grace. And didn't you notice that this sacrifice all of it was to be consumed. I underline the, the words in, in, in my Bible. If you look down to verse 9, it talks about the priest and its entrails and its legs will be washed with water and the priest shall burn all of it upon the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma unto the Lord. It was to be totally consumed. Could I add another S? We're in the S's this morning. Sacrifice. Spotless substitution reign. Sufficient. Sufficient. Now as we come to Good Friday and we think of our Saviour's suffering and death upon the cross at Calvary. Do you know the cry of triumph that came from that centre cross? Three words in English. It is finished. 19 chapter of John verse 30. One could say that's the very heart of the whole of the Bible. Everything that we've talked about this morning, all the shadows, all the types, all the prefigurings, all the foreshadowings, they pointed forward to this moment which to the eyes of men in their carnality and their blindness looked upon as a defeat 
was the greatest and most sublime victory that time or eternity will ever know. It was finished. The atonement was made. The price was paid. And Jesus paid it all. Can you see it here? Veiled under the shadow, under the type. <clears throat> the question, the question that therefore men ask, how can I make atonement? To use the words of Micah, how shall I come before God? Will God be pleased with this or that or the offering, the other things? No. But God is pleased with the work of his son. And as someone said, Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday we'll celebrate it. It was the Father's Amen to the Son's It is Finished. God has accepted the work of His Son as the grounds upon which an ungodly sinner distant from Him because of the rebellion and their sin can gain again access into His presence and know the joy of that presence and the fullness of pleasure that belongs to him. They can know that they're experiencing the, the smile of God upon them. Not because of anything they have done. But only because of what Jesus has done. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Here's where we stand, brethren and sisters, this morning. As Luther, we say we can do no other. May God help us. When we stand, when we stand upon the sufficiency of the work of Christ upon solid ground, the Father has accepted the Son's sacrifice. And he has given an amen to the sufficiency of His work. That leads me to the final word this morning. We thought about access, we thought about atonement, and then we think about acceptance. If you look again, if I could call your attention to the end of verse 3. He brings this burnt offering without blemish that he may be accepted before the Lord. He lays his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it shall be accepted for it shall be accepted for him. Can't you see this? You notice something very beautiful here that he was accepted because the sacrifice was accepted for him. There's the gospel. You and I are accepted by God because Christ's sacrifice is accepted for us. You put it any clearer or any more simply than that. And you notice there's something that happens here and I, I don't want to go off onto another sermon and I'm sure you don't want me to either this morning. But you'll notice that something occurs here that is occurs again and again in the book of Leviticus with reference to the sacrifices. It says he lays his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. He lays his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. I want to read a good sermon. Spur Spurgeon preached on this himself on, the, on those very words. Laying the hand upon the head of the sacrifice. Now that signifies many things. Don't want to go into the wall this morning. You find it on the day of atonement. When the high priest laid his hands upon the head of the sacrifice that was to be offered, and it was indicative of confession of sin, it was indicative of, uh, as it were, a symbolic transference of sin to the head of the sacrifice, and so on, and it was then to be killed. But the thought, I think, most of all, that comes through with this idea of the offerer laying his hand on the head of the sacrifice is the thought of identification with it. In effect, he was saying, this sacrifice is my sacrifice. This offering is made on my behalf. This is for me. 
this is mine. In effect, he was saying, go back to the hymn, the verses of which I've just quoted. Here's another verse. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. My faith will lay her hand, the hymn writer put the words, on that dear head of thine, why like a penitent I stand, and there confess my sin. Believing we rejoice, to see the curse removed, we bless the Lamb with cheerful voice, and sing his bleeding love. Friends, this morning our acceptance, and what a wonderful thought this morning, you and I are accepted by God. Accepted as righteous before God. Accepted into the presence of God. Accepted into the family of God. And in the words of Ephesians chapter 1, our acceptance is in the beloved. It's in Jesus Christ we are accepted because his sacrifice is accepted for us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for the good news. News that tells us not what to do, but of what has already been done. Thank you for that work, that substitutionary work, where that spotless lamb was sacrificed as our substitute. And making a once and for all sacrifice that was totally sufficient, that met every requirement and demand of the law that paid our debt in its totality. We thank the Lord that it is finished. And here we rest. We lay our hand again fresh upon the head of the burnt offering. And we say this is all our hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, rejoice our hearts again in this reality. We pray in Jesus' name.